standing in, uh, I'll just uh, give you the full bio here for David, although many of us uh, obviously know him. He's associate professor in uh, medicine and an associate faculty member of the Harris School and the Department of Economics here at the University of Chicago. He earned his MD and PhD um, here at the University of Chicago, completed his residency in internal medicine at the Brigham and Women's in Boston. Currently, he's the chief of the section of hospital medicine, where many of you are from. Um, Co-director of the program on outcomes research, training, and the MD-PhD program in the social scientists. He's a recipient of many awards, including the National Institutes <laughs> okay. of Health's Medical Scientist Training <laughs> Program can, Fellowship can, can and the on. NSF Graduate <laughs> Program. Um, he's going to talk to us uh, today about mobilizing uh, medical professionalism to redesign care for patients at high risk of hospitalization. Great, thank, thank you. you. Okay, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. It's, it's, um, it's, it's great always to talk to folks. Um, when I signed up for this um, over a year ago, there were two things I didn't know. One was that I would talk about this material to some extent in last year's workshop. The other thing I didn't know is that I would be writing a grant about this that's due in less than seven days. <laughs> so um, I spent a lot of time working on that grant because there are seven and a half million dollars at stake. I spent less time working on the slides, um, but the message will be there. And I also recognize that, um, that some of the people, in fact, many of the people here probably saw the talk that I gave last year. And so I'm going to go pretty quickly through the first half of the talk, which is really reviewing what I said last year. And then I'm going to spend the second half of the talk um, talking as best I can about what's in this grant. There are two reasons I can't talk fully about what should be in this grant. One is that it's not all there yet. And the other other is that some of it's actually really sensitive because it involves reorganizing care, which involves people's lives, and also um, that are not under my control, that I don't have the ability to manipulate. So there may be some things I can't answer for you when you ask questions, but I want you to ask those questions. Um, you know, we call these sometimes seminars and sometimes workshops. I view this as a workshop. In other words, I'm here to get work done, and the work I want to get done is I want to get your feedback about this idea. And so what I want people to do, if possible, is interrupt early, often. Um, I know how to move through the presentation to get it done quickly if I need to. So the idea that I'm going to talk about really is, is about redesigning care for patients at high risk of hospitalization. And, and the idea of sort of medical professionalism, professionalism in this isn't lip service. It's actually core to the idea. And I'll explain what I mean by that as, as we go through. So let me sort of start by saying quickly that I've been interested in medical specialization for a very long time. It's one of the classic questions of American medicine. American medicine has become incredibly specialized over time. The top line is the growth of specialists. The bottom line is the growth of generals in the US. No other country in the world has this pattern. There is a large empirical literature suggesting, in fact, that, um, that perhaps specialization isn't such a great thing. This is one of those examples. Um, this is the medical outcome study. They conclude in this study that patients cared for by specialists have worse costs, higher costs, worse outcomes than patients cared for by generalists. As an economist trained in sort of evaluating experimental design, I never liked this study. Why? Because who goes to specialists? They're people who are really sick and want a lot of care. So is it a surprise when they have bad outcomes and spent a lot of money? So very difficult to assess this. Um, I got very interested in wondering whether you could do better experimental studies of this. And I realized when I was a student here that our, our medicine services were a wonderful example to study this because patients are effectively randomly assigned to different types of doctors depending on the day they come in. And, and this set us up to study this. Now, let me just say that there are some very um, interesting theoretical issues in specialization. Specialization is probably the fundamental issue underlying a lot of economic theory. Um, um, Adam Smith begins the wealth of nations with this first sentence saying basically the greatest improvement in the productive power of, of labor, skill, dexterity, and judgment, which is anywhere directed, seems to come from the effects of the division of labor. In other words, um, people are becoming more productive over time because they specialize. And, and, and he argues from that that's why we need markets and an organized economy. 
He goes through and talks about why specialization is so good, using the example of a pin factory, <coughs> arguing that um, the, uh, the mechanism of advantage from specialization comes from improved dexterity as you do something again and again. Savings of time spent otherwise switching between tasks. So the pin maker doesn't have to go from the, from the place where the iron ore is melted to the smelter to the place where the wire is pulled to the factory where it's all um, spread out. So it's division of labor saves times. And then also application of machinery. So as you do something more and more, you develop new ways to do it. That can be human capital. It can be physical capital. If you think about all these things, you can tell all these stories in medicine. And the idea is that this theory of the division of labor sort of carries over to medicine just as in other areas of um, human endeavor. Now, um, Smith says the division of labor is great, but it's not everything. There's something that limits it. And the thing that Smith says limits it is what he calls the extent of the market. In other words, people could get more and more efficient at making pins. Um, the more they did it, the more they specialized. But eventually, no one wants all those pins. And so you stop feeding so many people into the pin making center. And so that limits the division of labor. A more modern version of things that generates the same result is what's called coordination cost. The idea that as you divide up tasks into smaller and smaller bits. You have huge costs as you move things from one step of the process to the next. And in medicine, I think we can all understand this when we think about the amount of time we spend coordinating with each other, the amount of the day that's spent communicating, for example, rather than not with the patient, but just with each other about care. And um, so this theory that sort of the optimal division of labor then is a balance between the benefits of specialization on the one hand and the costs of coordination of another. And um, this theory it was sort of most clearly stated in the modern era by um, two University of Chicago economists, Gary Becker and Kevin Murphy, who argue that the efficient division of labor sort of balances these two things. This paper is incredibly well cited. Interestingly, it's very rarely been directly tested. Now, let me point out that the theory that I've described so far comes out of economics. But exactly the same theory really is in deep in the medical ethics literature. So I think probably in many ways the classic paper of the doctor-patient relationship to this date is Francis Peabody's On the Care of the Patient. And the, the, the first sentence is the one that everyone always quotes. The treatment of a disease may be entirely impersonal. The care of the patient must be completely personal. The significance of the intimate personal relationship between the physician and the patient cannot be too strongly emphasized. So here, what he's saying is specialization, not such a good thing across, um, across different areas. You want a doctor who really knows the patient. But interestingly, if you read the second half, and I, I won't read it for you, he says, you know what, but you still need to know what you're doing in particular disease areas. And so even, even um, Francis Peabody is saying there's the same tension. He puts more emphasis on the know the patient side as opposed to be the specialist side. But the same tension is there. So this has kind of been the underlying model that people have used to think about the division of labor, in general and in medicine. There are other theories of specialization. And I've just gotten recently exposed to these through some of my interactions with people in the economics department. And, and the, the sort of new theory that people are thinking about is this theory of what's called adaptive organizations. And, and, and the idea here is the following. The classic economic theory says that in the presence of rising or falling coordination costs or returns to the division of labor, a, a firm will change the division of labor. What this theory says is that the firm may choose to simplify the good produced to reduce the cost of the division of labor. So for example, if you're struggling to make something that has one part that's metal and one part that's plastic, and to get those two entities to fit together, just make it all out of plastic. It's a lot easier. So change the good. And, and if, you, if, if you take this approach, it changes all the sort of predicted theoretical results about the division of labor. Coordination costs may not at all affect the, the sort of optimal division of labor and may even cause it to go in the opposite way than what you would have expected. And so what's the medical analogy to this? Well, the medical analogy is you can try to sort of change the nature of the product you're providing. You can, for example, use practice guidelines or standardized care, which in a lot of ways is what Lean is doing and what's being tried in this hospital now. You can sort of ignore the, preference of the preferences of the patient and just provide a standard product. That may not be a good thing, but one could do it. 
Another possibility is you could focus your care on different types of needs, patient needs. And um, for example, you could focus your team care on simpler patients and have another approach for the very complex patients. And I'll, that's essentially what I'm going to describe. Um, don't worry too much about that description of it because it's going to be much more clear later on. But it turns out what I'm basically going to argue is we need to change the product. Okay, And I'll try to explain how. Now, the context in which I'm going to look at this is the growth of hospital medicine. And I think everyone knows that traditionally in the US, primary care doctors have cared for patient and clinic in the hospital for general medical problems. Um, the traditional life of the doctor was you see the patient in the morning for rounds, and then you see your patients in clinic in the afternoon. With this, a tremendous emphasis on continuity of care, the value of the doctor-patient relationship. As much as this is dogma in the US, and maybe particularly at the University of Chicago, it is a unique perspective in the developed world. In all other countries, there are hospital doctors and there are clinic doctors, and they mostly don't overlap. So this term hospitalist grew up in the mid-1990s as physicians working at least 25% of their time in inpatient care. It's been the most rapidly growing medical specialty in the US. There are now 30,000 hospitalists caring for one third of all general medicine um, admissions. And the question that we've been asking is sort of, is this change in specialization a desirable one? And, and a related question that I've been looking at with um, support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is why did hospitalists actually grow? Now, there are sort of two theories about why hospitalists grew. One is that hospitalists grew to meet the needs of hospital care. So the idea here is there were greater incentives for control of hospital costs with the Medicare prospective payment system. Um, and so hospitalists arose to help hospitals cost those, um, decrease those costs. The other is that uh, and also that with that theory that uh, as um, that basically patients getting into the hospital were much sicker and so you needed doctors who could be there all the time. The other theory which I'll come to in a minute is that hospitalists rose not, not because of the needs of hospital care or, or to care for patients better but actually for the needs of ambulatory care which I'll really describe as the needs of the doctors and so I'll come to that in a minute. So let me just first very briefly talk about the data on sort of providing, sort of um, addressing the needs of hospital care. There have been a number of reviews of this. What they typically show is that there's strong evidence for resource savings and that outcomes are at least as good. As you look through these studies, there are a lot of concerns. Non-randomized study designs are very common, especially in non-academic settings, where in non-academic settings, traditionally in particular, the doctor went into the hospital to see the patient. That's been less true always in academic settings. Settings. So in some sense, all the really high quality data we have is not comparing a hospitalist to a doctor who actually knew the patient. Um, the studies very often have very poor power for outcomes. Um, so maybe outcomes really are different and we just couldn't detect it. Um, there's no data on the mechanism of effect. So if a hospitalist program works in one place, it might not work in another because it could be totally differently constructed. And there's very little data on effects on resource use after discharge. So we've done a series of studies of this. This was one of the first. We showed that um, we basically had a randomized design where patients are assigned to hospitalists or non-hospitalists based on the day they come into the hospital. And um, in the first year, there were sort of small decreases in length of stay relative for hospitalists relative to non-hospitalists. And they grew to about half a day and statistically significant in the second year. When we looked at mortality, we again saw that sort of no changes in post-discharge mortality in the first year, but by the time we got to the second year here, there was about a, a one-third reduction in 30 and 60-day mortality, which is kind of the right time frame if you believe these are real causal um, effects. We dug deeper into the data. We found that experience really mattered, that the hospitalists didn't seem to do a better job in resource savings when they started out. But as they'd been doing it longer and longer, they got better at it, in particular with disease-specific experience. So they see lots of community-acquired pneumonia. They get better at community-acquired pneumonia. So this is the classic sort of learning by doing story. We did a multi-center trial in a bunch of hospitals around the US. And long story short, um, Unadjusted analyses, it looked like a trend towards savings, but not significant. When you really work through the data more carefully, it looks like a reduction in length of stay and costs of about a little less than half a day and about $1,000 admission. So not huge, particularly against a backdrop of what I'll show you in a few minutes is, is tens of thousands of dollars for our patients in a year. But you know, some advantages. OK, now let me turn to the other story. The other story is that hospitalists grew not because they did a better job in the hospital, but because they better addressed the needs of ambulatory care, and in particular, the incentives of doctors. 
And the idea here is that there were, um, there were over a long period of time, and this is a, a, um, a slide from um, a paper that I published with um, Jeanette Chung, who's um, someone who was here at the University of Chicago for a number of years, um, showing the decline in the rate of in hospital admission relative to ambulatory admission in the United States over a series of decades. It fell by about 75%. And why did this happen? It's not because hospitalization fell. It's because ambulatory care rose. We were providing many, many more <coughs> clinic visits, largely because ambulatory care started to emphasize prevention. And what this meant is you could fill your, as a doctor, full-time doctor, you could fill your whole day seeing patients and almost never admit anyone to the hospital. Whereas in the past, patients went to a doctor because they weren't feeling well and a pretty sizable fraction of them needed to go into the hospital. So every day you had patients there in the hospital. So the bottom line is um, patient doctors just sort of didn't want to make the trip anymore. And with um, the organization of physicians into groups, it was easy for these doctors to sort of turn over their, their hospital activities to another member of the group. These doctors sooner or later became hospitalists, and that's in many ways how this sort of trend grew. I'll just say we've, we've done some work on sort of the ambulatory economics of hospitalist growth testing this. We sort of start with a theoretical model where sort of a traditional internist model, the internist spends their time seeing patients in the hospital and in clinic and also has to drive back and forth between the two. Whereas in the hospitalist PCP model, the hospitalist and the PCP are each always located in that place so they don't have to drive, but they have to spend time communicating with each other. So when you difference out the cost between these to. These costs are heavily driven by how likely patients are to be admitted, what communication costs are, what transport costs are, and even subtle things like how many hours a doctor works. Because if they work a very, long, very large number of hours, relatively speaking, they're going to have more clinic visits and therefore more hospital visits, and it will make more sense to go to the hospital. So. Um, you get a, theories, a series of theoretical predictions that basically suggest the PCP or hospitalist model will be less costly than the traditional model when admissions fall relative to ambulatory visits, um, um, when, um, um, I think there's a mistake there, um, um, when communication um, costs are, are low, when transport costs are high, and when physicians work, work fewer hours. And when we go through this empirically, we get a set of predictions that basically will say, well, if, if you have a lot of older patients, then you're going to, or then you're going to have more admissions, you'll be more likely to use hospitalists. If you have better health IT, you're going to be um, more likely to use hospitalists, easier to communicate. When transport costs are high, it's going to be hard to drive, you're going to be more likely to use hospitalists. And when physicians work fewer hours, um, for example, if they're just in general working fewer hours or the entry of women into um, medicine increasingly, on average women work fewer hours, all those things would be predicted to increase the use of hospitalists. And we use some data from the community track study to test all these things. These are some of the explanatory variables um, that we use to test it. And long story short, every one of the theoretical predictions was supported by the model. So anyway, we test this empirically. All the results are supported. So, so you know, this just sort of summarizes what I just said. And we're left with this sort of question. Well, is the use of hospitalists just a sort of unfortunate economic necessity of changes in ambulatory care? So the question is, you know, is there a better model? And, and what I've been thinking about, and, and I, I should just say, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, and I meant to. A million people have helped me with this, many of them in this room, and, and many more to help also. And so you all know who you are, and thank you. <laughs> so um, the, um, the idea is the following. If, if the problem is doctors aren't admitting enough patients to the hospital to have a real physical presence there on a daily basis, what if we could find a way to have doctors admitting patients often enough that it made sense to, for them to be there on a regular basis? And one way to do it is to break up the patients into those at low risk of hospitalization and those at high risk of hospitalization. And so the idea here is you, identify, you stratify patients by expected <coughs> hospital use. And if you have low expected hospital use, you get sort of the model we've moved towards. You have an ambulatory-based primary care physician, and in the rare instance you get hospitalized, you get a hospitalist. And I would argue that may be the best we can do, OK? Of course, add communication and better handoffs and all that other stuff, and health IT, which is going to solve everything. And then um, the alternative is then if you are at high risk of hospital use, and it turns out to be amazingly easy to predict this. <laughs> 
Then you get a, a new kind of doctor, which I still don't have a good name I can use publicly for. And, um, and the, the, the idea is to, that these comprehensive care physicians would basically see these patients only, who are at high risk of hospitalization, but see them both in the hospital and in clinic. And because they're only seeing high risk patients, they could have a relatively small clinic and still have um, patients in the hospital every morning and to be able to see them. And so that's the idea that we've been developing. And what are some of the advantages? The most frequently hospitalized patients would get their own doctor, someone who knows them. We could call this relational capital in both settings. We know patients value continuity, and I'll talk about this more in a minute. Continuity may, sort of, there's another typo, may, may decrease uh, unneeded um, testing and treatment, especially for these patients. Continuity also makes it a lot easier easier for the doctor. It is much easier to care for a patient you know than a patient you don't know. It means you can spend more time with the patient and less time with the chart. And anyone who's looked at the new EPIC notes um, on the inpatient side, I mean, it's impossible. They're 15 pages long, and anyone who reads them all is a liar, says they read them all is a liar. Um, OK. So um, all hospitalized patients get doctors with significant hospital experience and presence. In other words, these doctors are still spending enough time in the hospital that they really you know, are expert there. Patients can choose this. They don't have to be forced into it. I believe there are ways to make this sort of model the PCH would be primary care hospitalist, which could be another name for this, to work for a physician. It could work within patient-centered medical homes, their incentives with this with bundling and readmissions. A lot of the big savings here would be preventing admissions. We don't have good incentives to do that right now in our system, but all that is coming. For small hospitals, an advantage of this, particularly if they're having trouble filling themselves, is they could build a very small primary care base, and out of that small primary care base, admit a lot of patients to the hospital. What are some of the challenges? And this is a very partial list. Um, are enough patients willing to switch? Will doctors let their patients switch? Will doctors do this job, and can it be economically viable? Um, so what's the research approach? What are we doing? We've been talking to a bunch of people to try to assess their interest and the challenges. We've been thinking about some observational studies, sort of quantitative analyses of these sort of models elsewhere and qualitative analyses of similar models. There are some sort of similar-ish models floating around, although nothing exactly like this focused on these doctors who do both in both settings. We've been thinking about sort of implementation and pilot studies, for example, predictive modeling to identify these um, groups of patients with high enough predicted hospital use to allow adequate inpatient volume. Um, I've been working with um, Tom Best, who used to be here in the hospital but is now in the business school, um, doing simulation modeling to set this up. And now the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is actually talking about demonstration studies. And I'll come to that in a minute, and that's where I really want to spend and the bulk of the, the time. What is my dream study? The dream study is, with permission of PCPs or patients, whoever really needs to get the right permission, offer patients cared for under this sort of traditional model, the, or the, sorry, the PCP hospitalist model, the opportunity to be randomly assigned to this new model of care. So a true randomized trial. Where could you do this? You could do it in a managed care organization operating under capitation. Unfortunately, we don't work for one. Um, the, um, we, you could do it in low occupancy community hospitals where they're just basically looking for ways to find patients and they would certainly go for this. And then what I'm gonna talk about today, the CMMI demonstration project. So what is CMMI? I'll just say CMMI is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. It was created under the Affordable Care Act to try to revolutionize the way Medicare provides care. Um, they have um, allocated a billion dollars, that's with a B, um, this year to, this year, <laughs> to, quote, fund applicants who propose compelling new models of service delivery payment improvements that hold the promise for delivering, this is the question about what the goals are, the three-part aim of better health, better health care, and lower costs through improved quality for Medicare, Medicaid, and SHIP enrollees. They are giving out grants of one to $30 million over three years. They are due Jan January 27th, which is 10 <laughs> days from now. They are 40 pages double spaced. I just discovered with one inch margins and 12 inch fonts, which I have now learned is very different than a half inch margin and 11 point font. And, um, they, and you have to add 30 pages of vaguely described supporting materials. Okay, so it's really a, um, actually a bit of a mess. So these are the aims. And um, I don't want to read them out loud, maybe so, so I'll, let, I'll let people read them. 
So, but I, I will try to summarize them. So the, the first goal is to implement this new model of care here at, at the U of C. And um, the sort of last part of that first aim says, with economic rewards for savings to Medicare shared with the Academic Medical Center. So written in the grant is an incentive that if we save money, we will get that, we will get a payment. Okay, so it's combined delivery system and payment reform. Um, that's the first goal. The second goal is among patients who meet the criteria for this and are willing to, the clinical criteria for this, and are willing to receive care in the model to assess the utilization and quality of health care, health outcomes, and cost of care for patients randomly assigned to be offered care in this model compared to patients randomly assigned not to be offered care. So we plan to do an actual randomized trial. Um, the control group in that model is patients within our own system who don't get this care, okay? Although they may choose not to stay in our system, in which case we still follow them with Medicare data. But we, one of the things we want to do is also have some other control groups because I don't think in the long run Medicare can do randomized trials as part of its payment model, <laughs> right? So we need to see how well other control groups will work. And some of those other control groups could be similar patients in other academic medical centers. So we have a grant that we've gotten and a project we're working on to work with University Health System Consortium and a bunch of other Chicago area hospitals to get data to help us do that. That's the third aim. The, um, the, the, um, the, the, that, that third aim is really to get the data. The fourth aim is to actually look at a whole bunch of different comparator groups with this. Other patients within UCMC, other patients um, currently, other patients historically at UCMC, and, and patients in some of the other Chicago area medical centers. And then finally, um, the grant requires that you really um, have a sort of human capital investment component of this. And so we're talking about training for physicians in this model, and really I should change this to reflect a bunch of multidisciplinary providers who will be part of it, and then um, also medical fellows who we think could be involved, and then medical residents and, and, and medical students. Okay, so here are the, some of the key conceptual ideas. One, focus on high cost patients. We know, for example, in Medicare, 5% of people represent 40% of the costs, 10% of people, 60% of the cost. To put a number on this, the, and these are old numbers, so inflate them by like almost 50%. The top 5% of Medicare spend $62,000 a year versus the bottom 95% that spends only $4,000 a year. So the, the implication of this is that even if you say cut savings 10% in the bottom part, it's hard to save very very much money because you have to take the cost of the intervention out of that. And this is sort of, you know, Willie Sutton's, you know, why do you rob banks because that's where the money is. Focus on continuity of the doctor-patient relationship. There is an amazing literature out there, and Mark and I are beginning to work on assembling this. Mark even hasn't seen some of these studies, or maybe he just knows them. Um, um, so there are observational studies at, at the end of life that show having one provider in a continuing way lowers, for example, ICU use by 25%. There's this amazing experimental study in primary care done in the 80s where they randomized patients. Do you know this study? This is a great study. They, in the VA, they took patients. Half of them were given the same doctor for every clinic visit. The other half at random were every visit given a different random doctor where the only constraint is that doctor couldn't have seen them in the prior <laughs> visit. The, <laughs> in the VA, probably. Um, the effect of, of continuing care, a 20% reduction in hospitalization, a 38% reduction in hospital days, and a 75% reduction in ICU length of stay. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So there is a sort of deep ther theoretical literature, and this is tied to our evaluation on how continuity improves the doctor-patient relationship, and the doctor-patient relationship in turn improves costs. Um, there's a, there are sort of frameworks for measuring the quality of the doctor-patient relationship that emphasize trust, the interpersonal relationship, communication, and knowledge, which you know spells trick. <laughs> um, so that's the trick. And, um, and what does that do? It gives you satisfa patient, better patient satisfaction, which is already an outcome, better adherence, reduced errors, lower costs of communication. Okay, those are two big ideas. Another big idea is this idea of focusing on shared savings. Now, what does this mean? Well, capitation and prospective payment 
are the clearest way to lower costs. You give a provider a fixed amount of money, and whatever they you know, manage to save, they get to keep. It has several huge problems. Risk selection is one. So you can always sort of make money better by just selecting healthy people in. And, um, and also, there are huge risk issues. What if you happen to get a really expensive person, and then you're bankrupt? So shared savings is sort of a compromise. Basically, what it is is that you estimate the savings in some way or another, and you get some fraction of them. And that's what we're going to end up sort of proposing. And it's something that they talk about in these proposals. So practice design. And again, this, we have a lot to figure out. I, there are a lot of things we just don't know about how this is going to work. But here's the idea. You would select patients who are expected to have at least 10 days in the hospital per year. That number is set based on the idea that given the number of clinic spots you have, you have to have, say, five patients in the hospital every day. It turns out it's really easy to find patients who are expected to have 10 days a year in the hospital. Every patient we admitted in GENS is predicted to have 10 years a day in the hospital. The average is 10 and a half. If you've been admitted to general medicine in the, in the past year, it's actually, I'm sorry, that's, I don't think it's 12 days. I actually think it's 16 days. I'm sorry, let me get it right. If you're, if you're admitted to GENS, 12 days is the average. If you um, have been admitted previously to GENS, it's 16 days in the next year. And even if it's your first admit, 10 and a half days is the predicted number for the rest of the year. Where would you find these patients? I don't want to steal them from doctors who already have them. Well, resident and fellow clinics. They leave every third year. They often pick up these very sick patients. And it's not good for them to be the patients to be handed off every year. We do have doctors who leave the University of Chicago. I can't understand why, but it happens. And um, unassigned, hospitalized patients could also be a group. We'd have 1,500 patients over three years. They'd be randomized to the intervention and the rest to the control. Um, the um, physicians, these comprehensive care physicians, would have this job of seeing patients in the morning in the hospital. In the afternoon, they'd be in clinic. Uh, you know, probably a couple of afternoons a week. There'd probably a, be a big chunk of time in the middle of the day that would be sort of free for, for other things. Um, they had afternoon coverage by um, these either the comprehensive care physicians themselves in rotation, or maybe hospitalists, and certainly NPs. Nighttime coverage could get folded in, for example, to some of our existing services. How many patients would they care for? <laughs> Typical primary care doctor full time in the US has probably 3,000 patients in their panel. These would have about 200, a tiny, tiny group of patients. And I should say these could be specialists. Okay, you know, caring for patients with specialized needs. And I think people can make up their own list of what specialties those might be. And again, I, 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 I'm very careful because I want to be really respectful that I don't control these clinical domains. Other people do. And ultimately, the decision about this has to be theirs. Um, this needs not just to be about doctors. Multi multidisciplinary teams are critical. An RN, an LPN, a medical assistant, a social worker, we would add to the model who sort of work between the inpatient and outpatient setting. One of the hardest things would be sort of coordinating this with the resources we already have. Um, one idea we've had is integrated home health. Home health is a really important part of keeping patients out of the hospital. Unfortunately, right now, when most of us deal with home health, these are completely anonymous relationships. We could make these actually personal, where we had relationships between home health care providers and these teams. <laughs> Um, IT is important. We do have Epic, but Epic does not reach out into the community. It does not collect what, connect well to patients. So there's a company called PeopleChart, which makes a personal health record, or, or PHR, which is um, um, very easily accessible for patients and providers even who sit outside of our system. And for doctors who really focused on this could use it. It was actually started by a U of C grad, so we're thinking about that. These sort of outpatient-oriented resource mobilization things are really critical elements of, of Mary Nay um, transitional care model. It's also really important to think about patient education and empowerment. And one of the other big models, um, Eric Coleman's care transitions model to prevent readmissions, really emphasizes that. And so that's going to be an important part of the role of all these team members in educating the patients. Now, as you think about this team, you have to think about how it's all going to work together. And I think there are some very powerful ideas in Lean about how it is you get these individuals to work together. So what are some ideas that this would mean? So for example, I think you want the smallest appropriate number of people involved in the care of each patient, someone who they know who to go to. And for some, it may be the doctor, for some, the NP, for some, the social worker. Um, Cross-training and process design to support that. In other words, I don't understand why, as a doctor, have no idea how to order home health care. It does not seem like it's beyond me intellectually, but I certainly don't know how to do it. 
um, transparent delineation of roles for patients and family and multidisciplinary team members so that everyone knows what their role is in the team. Let me just, I, I, I think we're supposed to end in about five minutes officially, but is, um, let me just, I just want to run through some of this very quickly. Baseline Medicare costs, as I said, this is the business case, about $75,000. The cost of the program in total, including evaluation and startups, about $3,000 a person per year. The real direct care cost part of this is only about $500 a year. Most of it is research. The break-even savings, if you could save 4% of total cost, you would pay for this completely. If you could save even less than one percent, you would pay for all the direct costs, which are likely to be the sustainable costs. To put it in contrast, the care coordination literature, for example, in CHF and asthma, suggests you can lower admissions, which is essentially proportional to cost, by 25 to 40 percent. Primary care continuity, this is the study I mentioned earlier, decreases hospital and ICU days by 40 to 75 percent. What would the shared savings model look like? We estimate that if these numbers are, are sort of right, there would be um, about $190, $190 million in spending for these patients over two and a half years. We're asking for seven and a half million. The estimated reduction in savings, even if it were only 10 percent uh, to 25 percent, and it might well be more, would be 20 to 45 million compared to the control patients. We're asking for 20 percent of the savings starting with the first dollar and sort of scaling up with a cap over the year as, the, as this grew for a total of one and a half million over three years. Um, the total cost of the program would be three to eight percent of estimated savings for Medicare. So that would be a really attractive um, deal for them. So they spend seven and a half million and basically save potentially 37 and a half. And we're not building in a cost for the UFC if this doesn't work for increased costs. Sustainability. Um, patients, they keep coming because it's good care, better outcomes, better satisfaction. With physicians, the challenge is going to be a tolerable workload and adequate supports, the feelings they can actually make the place and make the system work. They need to be professionally recognized and supported. Mark and I have had a lot of conversations about this. The hospital, well, it's going to get their costs covered by the new payment model and they'll fill the beds the other way. Um, and, and in the long run, the costs like this would be supported by new payment models. And I think the bottom line is that the people in the hospital recognize if they do not do this and learn how to manage care, they will go out of business, okay? Um, Medicare, excellent ROI. They can't do um, randomization for this model in the long run, but they could use, you know, sort of risk adjustment or this model could be folded into an accountable care organization so it could be sustainable for that. <sighs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>